All right, we've got a new investigative report recently published about that shame game and fantastic, dropping some banger new details about the studio and for once, the game's publisher. And we knew this was coming, right? The rats have now abandoned the sinking ship as it ran aground and we're starting to get those sweaty details from those that were there. And even with all the time I've spent investigating these clowns, I actually learned a lot. Welcome back, I am Lieutenant Buzz Lightbeer, and oh my, the details are aplenty. Outlining the rife incompetence on full display at Fantastic, now in HD, as we've got even more detail, and there's some outright sickening accounts here as well. I'm again shooting to keep this commentary completely unscripted, I mean, I've got some basic notes, but here goes again because you ladies and gents seem to enjoy this format. Remember to hit subscribe and ring the notifications bell to receive my upload alerts, and let's dive once more into the day before. Coming to us from a collab effort between Game 2 and Game Star, both German media outlets, and they've apparently now taken the plunge into the day before cesspool. Anyways, they've interviewed 16 former Fantastic employees, one volunteer, and seven Mytona employees, which, by the way, is extraordinarily rare. We've seen former devs talk, but very little from the game's publisher, and... They've got some interesting things to say, that's for sure. Now, of course, most wish to stay anonymous, but not all. And you can either read through the article for yourself on GameStar's website, but it's going to require a subscription to reveal the entire body of the text. I opted to not do that, privacy and all. But they also have a video format version on the Game 2 YouTube channel, which is in German. Thank God for auto-translate. And can I just say that the production value of this video they published is just fucking top shelf. I'm envious. I mean, I wish my videos looked this damn good. Now, I'm going to do my best to steer clear of the regular, more commonly known details about Fantastic, about the Gotatsev brothers, about the day before, and if you want to know everything that came before what I'm about to report on, I've got an extensive day before playlist found here on the channel. Just check it out and get caught up. Now for me, where I started to say, huh, okay, with this whole expose video is some of the details they've actually uncovered that I wasn't aware of. And I've done an extensive amount of research about Fantastic and the Brothers and the whole Day Before Saga. For instance, we often associate The Wild Eight as the first game that Fantastic was involved with, which is factual, it is true, but it is not the first dev work that Edward, the older of the brothers, took part in. Now, he was a part of a team that developed Midnight Macabre, Mystery of the Elephant, back in 2012. And through the vague internet search I was able to perform, it says that the studio behind it was Dango Games, which, honestly, I've never heard of. And apparently this game is a point-and-click hidden object adventure game. But, you know, this kind of sets the tone of this interview, because as I said, this investigative team really dug deep, even showing early interviews and presentations. This is also where we start to hear about the Ushnitsky brothers, founders of Mytona and also from the same region of Russia, Yakutsk, and how they were influential in getting Edward and Eisen into game development. And I'm sure we're going to learn even more details about all of that as it will slowly float to the surface in time. Anyways, let's now fast forward to 2015 and we're up to a known quantity, the Wild Eight, which we now learn got its name from the eight devs who worked on the game. Now, the game was funded by a Kickstarter program asking for 60,000 US dollars in assistance. Again, known items here, but what was not widely known is that without a $12,000 donation from the Ushniskis, the campaign would have fallen short of its goals. And then, of course, onto another known quantity seven months after releasing into early access, and under vague and disturbing circumstances, the Wild Eight is sold to its publisher. Now we're up to the fantastic studio days, and the studio actually starts off with roughly 20 devs, half working on a mobile game, which turned out to be the Radiant one, and the other half on a top-secret project that would become the day before. Not the extraction shooter version we saw back in December, but a much more stylized, cartoon-looking game. And another little-known fact here is that after the Radiant one released, 
it tried to install a subscription model with premium currencies and almost immediately tanked which again, I did not know about. Anyways, back to this early version of the day before, and it's basically the Wild 8, now in third person and with zombies. It was supposed to be a small survival game built for single player with limited co-op and was never to be an online MMO. And we know what happened later on with that design change. In this timeline, we still haven't reached the 2021 day before announcement trailer. So this is kind of pre all of those shenanigans and Prop Night is currently in development. Now the dev team uses the same stylized cartoon look as that original day before concept and then adopts a combo of Dead by Daylight and Prop Hunt into <laughs> original name here, Prop Night. Now an item of note uncovered by these interviews is that if you were a dev and you were working on Prop Night, you were almost viewed as a rookie a second stringer, if you will, and Prop Night was used as a dev team boot camp. Now, once you had proven yourself over there, you were then moved up to the A team, working on the day before, but at this point, it was a highly altered day before from that original cartoon version. Of course, the 2021 day before announcement trailer now drops. The zombie survival MMO world is rocked to its very core. Where and what is that? Well, it was a pipe dream we all saw over on IGN. It was vaporware, as according to these sources, there was nothing functional about that demo, nor a real game at that point. It was just a vertical slice trailer created by a team that was tasked to just work on that trailer, which was further confirmed by the previous IXBT Games video I covered here on the channel. This trailer was a completely separate build that was incredibly CPU intensive, wasn't optimized, and was simply unplayable. And that's why scenes and mechanics that you see in the trailer are not in the game. They were made by separate teams in separate environments. Now, allegedly, the dev team that was working on the game did not like the look of that trailer, but the Gotatsevs would not allow any discussion on the subject. That trailer and all future reveals followed the now published mantra, do like they do, as they attempted to copy more successful AAA releases. At this point, the game was changing on the daily. GTA Online, Hogwarts, even Baldur's Gate 3 were all used as reference points. I mean, if the brothers saw it and they played it in those games, they immediately wanted the day before to include this or that from those other, what they viewed to be highly successful games. Now, this apparently led to three different versions of the day before in a five-year span, which could go a little ways to explaining why it was so bad at launch. And also, another little known fact here is that somewhere in here, Fantastic found the time to pair up with Apple Russia for the 2018 release of a game called Ever Builders, which, surprise, surprise, was then abandoned one month after release. We knew this group had a pattern of releasing and abandoning titles, but the pattern is widened with these new details. And I'm still stunned this group was allowed to continue in the gaming market, especially after this established pattern of just abandoning everything they ever released. So you're probably asking yourself, what happened to Continent, that fabled workplace app that was designed to declare war on offices? Well. We know that it failed, but what was not known is that Fantastic actually continued to use it even after that commercial failure because of the internal mechanics that were incorporated into their app. Well, listen to this. It could see if a workstation was occupied at any time, even when working from home, and communication could happen at the touch of a button, and employees were required to react immediately, which obviously caused tremendous stress. And I always wondered, what happened to Continent, and here we find out. It was used to spy on employees and harass them at all hours of the day or night, even when working from home. Even the whole volunteer culture at Fantastic was grossly misrepresented by the Gotatsevs in that weird video they published and have now deleted, trying to explain the entire volunteer culture at Fantastic. Now, what they said publicly and what they did privately with this label were two separate items. Yes, a volunteer workforce was called for and assembled, mainly to use to build up loyalty to the studio, and for many of these volunteers, their talents 
were never utilized, instead being sent to work on things like localizations or just general game testing. But here's where it gets really, really interesting. To the Gotatsevs, since you technically volunteered to work at Fantastic, that is, you were willingly applying to work there, and we're now speaking of paid employees, well, since you volunteered to work, then overtime was also voluntary and was therefore unpaid. Those that did not comply were dismissed. And so immediately the question becomes, why in the hell would anyone that was apparently a trained developer, why would they subject themselves to these business practices? And again, here's where we get even more details, is apparently the brothers were very selective in where they recruited developers from. Scarcely populated regions were ideal like Kazakhstan and Armenia, along with Yakutsk, because development jobs there were scarce, and so they could hire employees that would tolerate this level of behavior. Now to these devs, they were thinking, hey, we're working. We're gonna be making a name for themselves, and the pay for them was far better than what they could get back home. Because to them, these young devs were thinking, hey, we're working, we're going to be making a name for ourselves, and apparently the pay was far better than what they could get back home. The Gogtatsevs ruled through fear, even deploying a tactic of spontaneous dismissals as an important means of motivating employees. Former Fantastic employees went on record and gave descriptions of what working there was like, and this is nothing short of sweatshop conditions. Never worked less than 16 hours a day, worked for a year and a half with no Saturdays off, and for the last two months, no days off at all. Some days, working through the night to 9 a.m. the following morning, only to be called into the office an hour later. And then this final one kind of sums it up, Five hours of sleep, no vacations, no weekends, no free time, ever. This next part of the interview just blew my mind, as if the employee workplace testimonials was not enough. So apparently, Fantastic was more than happy to supply employees with required work equipment. Things that developers might need, like, say, a laptop. But... Here's where it gets interesting. It had to be repaid back to Fantastic via the worker salaries, further tying them to the studio because if these workers were dismissed, they not only had no job, but they also left in debt. Yeah, that's just f***ing insane. Furthermore, if the brothers were displeased or mistakes were made, the offending employees had to pay fines. One example is that two people had to pay a whopping $1,930 fine for supposedly low quality voice recordings. And you ask, what voice? Because the entire game uses AI voice recordings. Now, I can't answer that, but these two new details, charging for required workplace equipment and levying fines for supposedly submitting subpar work, that's just mind blowing. Anyways, back to the game itself, and each time it was just about to launch and was met with another delay announcement, the state of the game, at least according to these developers, was dismal. Nowhere close to being a game and certainly not a playable product. Beta test never happened, what a surprise there, despite the bravado and announcements from the studio, as there were only five internal testers and one of them was fired a week before the release of the day before because the brothers apparently found a bug contained within the game. And here's where Mytona, the game's publisher and apparently single funding source, now enters the picture. My question always circles back to how could Mytona not know what was going on here? And according to these uh, former employees, it was because they viewed the Gotatsevs as some kind of gaming geniuses to be trusted on all matters and not disturbed with trivial questions or concerns. I mean, talk about being a bad judge of character here. But something now happens behind the scenes. What it was is not mentioned, and I would love to be a fly on the wall for that one, but Mytona ends up sending over a group of experienced specialists to evaluate the state of the game, to see what the brothers at Fantastic have cooked up with this AAA product the day before, and it does not go down well. The report was, they reported back, the game would need to be developed from scratch, or at least it needed to be postponed by another 
two to three years. Things were apparently bad enough, and here's where we learn another new detail from this interview, that Mytona actually conducted an internal poll of its workers, asking them how many of them would be willing to develop the game internally. So it kind of boils down to, hey, Mytonaites, the day before is terrible. How many of you are willing to bring it back from the dead? And keep in mind, this all goes down before the game's release. Well, the poll received 320 votes, 300 said hell no to that idea, and only 20 employees were in favor of putting in the work on the day before. So even Mytona, at this point, before the game's release, knew the game was a fucking sham. I find these little details so interesting, especially the part Mytona played in all of this. And we've not seen much about them in the past, and it was speculated they knew what the product was like prior to go live. And here we get confirmation that they knew and they still went ahead with the day before's release. The rest is common knowledge. December 7th rolls around, the day before goes live, it's bad. Four days later, the fabled internal letter stating the game's financial failure surfaces, and we also learn the fact that Fantastic would now be closing its doors. Now, according to these sources, the Gotatsev brothers were completely missing the day of the game's release. Big surprise there. My theory is they probably went into hiding. And we also learned this. They have now started a new studio and are beginning work on a mobile title. Now, we knew about that new title, but the fact that they've actually started a new studio, I did not know that. And man, if I was there asking questions of these employees, my first follow-up would have been, where is this studio located and what is the name it is listed under? And sadly, nothing here about those two items, but I expect we'll learn more about that in the very near future. I know for many of you, the story of Fantastic and the Day Before is seemingly over. It's dead and gone. It was a wild two-year roller coaster. But in terms of time frame, this story's just getting started. We've just climbed the first giant hill and made the plunge afterwards on this roller coaster, what comes next are all the loops and the corkscrews and tight corners. The details are going to continue to bubble up as employees speak out, and there is far more to this fiasco than we ever knew. Stay tuned for more follow-up reports here on the channel, and be in the know by hitting subscribe and ringing that notifications bell. All my socials can be found in the video description, including Twitter, where I do post most of my findings. Shout out to the now over 190,000 of you that have stuck with me, and if you haven't yet taken the plunge, consider hitting that big red sub button, and help me out as we make that last push to 200,000 subscribers. Links to today's sources can be found in the video description, and until the next one, this is Lieutenant Buzz Lightbeer, signing off.